Good afternoon, and welcome to today's NAJA Virtual Roundtable into the Broken Trust Investigation. Our panelists will discuss and elaborate on a series of stories launched by the Aboriginal People's Television Network's investigative team that led to an independent inquiry into the treatment of Indigenous women by the state police. The team, APTN Investigates, is this year's Richard LaCourse Award for Investigative Journalism winner for this reporting and its impact. This webinar is part of a series of roundtables hosted by the Native American Journalists Association that will discuss and examine the unique challenges of covering issues that affect Indigenous communities. This webinar is being recorded and streamed on Facebook Live, and the recorded video will be linked to the NAJA website and posted to the NAJA Facebook page and the YouTube channel. This roundtable series would not be possible without the generous support of our sponsors, the Ford Foundation, Knight Foundation, Democracy Fund, the Google News Initiative, Walton Family Foundation, Tegna Foundation, and the Gannett Foundation. We thank all of them for their continued support. Our panel moderator is Francine Compton, the current NAJA president and the executive show producer at APTN National News. Francine will facilitate this important discussion and introduce our esteemed panelists. Francine will take questions from the audience. Please use the Q&A option to submit a question and it will be posed to the panel as time allows. Francine, the round table is yours. Miigwech, Brian, Anin viewers. I'm Francine Compton. I'm here at APTN's World Headquarters in Winnipeg, Canada. Thank you for tuning in. And uh, as Brian mentioned, we're here to uh, discuss the APTN investigation uh, into broken trust. Uh, just to give you a little bit of a background before we meet our panelists and before we get talking, uh, APTN investigates have been working with a woman uh, who was a victim of a scheme in British Columbia here in Canada, uh, in uh, the town known as Kelowna, uh, a social worker there was found to be taking advantage of vulnerable Indigenous youth who are in the child welfare system. And uh, our, our award-winning video journalist, uh, who's not with us today, Colin Crozier, he's out there working, producing a story, but he wrote and directed an episode about the cases that went to trial from that scheme and Broken Trust aired on APTN in March of 2019. Uh, now out of that civil trial, uh, an interrogation video emerged as evidence. Uh, APTN investigates uh, producers stayed in very close touch with the victim and exclusively obtained that tape. Now the tape uh, that showed uh, Kelowna RCMP officer, an, R an officer with the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, that's uh, Canada's federal police, uh, that officer was uh, on that tape aggressively interrogating an underaged Indigenous woman uh, who's in the care of the child welfare system. The interrogation was about her reported sexual assault. Uh, now our producer went on to expertly and exclusively work with the woman, producing a number of stories that led to that uh, an external review of all sexual assault cases handled by that Kelowna RCMP detachment. And uh, that led to the revelation that the numbers of under-investigated sexual assault cases in Kelowna were 40% higher than the rest of Canada. And it's important to note that, uh, it, that that offered a very rare glimpse into how some Indigenous women are treated in the Canadian justice system. And it was a theme born out of the testimonies at the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls. Uh, now that I've given a brief introduction of why we're here and what brought us together, let's meet our panel. We're joined by uh, Ojibwe journalist, Mary Pember. She is a citizen of the Red Cliff Band of Wisconsin Ojibwe tribe. She is currently the national correspondent for Indian Country Today. Her work has been published at the Washington Post, the New York Times and the Guardian, just to name a few. 
Mary served as president of NAJA between 2000 and 2002 and also held the position of executive director. Uh, and to give you a sense of the stories that uh, Mary has reported on, uh, she was a fellow at the University of Maryland uh, Journalism Fellowship in Child and Family Policy. She won a Clarion Award from the Association for Women in Communications for Best Feature Writing for Stories Exposing Sex Trafficking of Native Women. And most recently, Mary was recognized with the Native American Journalists Medill School of Journalism Lifetime Achievement Award. That was in 2018. Thank you, Mary, for being on the panel with us today. Now to introduce you to my APTN uh, colleagues, Holly Moore, the producer of APTN Investigates. She comes to us with well over 16 years of experience working on news and investigative news and documentaries before she joined us here at APTN in 2016. She was an associate producer with uh, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation here uh, in Canada, CBC Manitoba. Uh, for their investigative team, she produced nationwide projects for their Indigenous unit and has been nominated for a number of national awards. And most recently, uh, her and the, the team from APTN Investigates, uh, their most recent was the Canadian Association of Journalists Open Broadcast Feature Award for uh, their documentary, Broken Circle. And I also want to introduce you to Brittany Theo. Brittany uh, grew up here in Winnipeg, like me, and uh, she is a member of the Northlands, the Nesulene First Nation. And uh, Brittany came to APTN through uh, CAJ uh, APTN Investigative Fellowship. She now is an investigative reporter with APTN Investigates has a keen interest in justice reporting and did uh, much of the research for the work that went into uh, Broken Trust. So that's our panel and uh, let's get right into it. Holly, I wanna go to you. Um, we heard uh, some of the steps that led to this, but can you tell us uh, how this work uh, came together, how it started with, with you? Sure. So we didn't break this story. It was actually broken by the Vancouver Sun, a newspaper in Vancouver. And it was just a little blurb that says, you know, a ledge scheme uh, harms a, over a dozen Indigenous teenagers in care. And I actually stood up from my desk and I went, WTF? Like, there is more to this story than this little small article. So I started to think that um, you know, given the number, the, uh, the sheer overwhelming number of kids in this scheme who were Indigenous, that there had to be something else at work. Uh, so I started following the comments on the Facebook page for the Vancouver Sun, and clearly it emerged the number of these victims were writing in and leaving comments because they had all been anonymized because they were kids in care. So I got in touch with a number of them and said, hey, I'm what you up to? I'm a reporter, uh, I'm a producer, and I developed a really close relationship with Aiden Withers, who is actually the young woman who is being interrogated in the sex assault video. So it was, it was one of those instinctual moments as a reporter where you go, oh, there, there is a big story here. And as it turned out, there was. So Colin Crozier was dispatched to produce an episode of APTN Investigates for us. He did an amazing job with Aiden. And I stay, one of the things that Aiden had said to me when we were doing our pre-interview was, I reported a sexual assault and they ignored it. And I thought, okay, well, there must be video of this somewhere. So when she brought her civil case against the BC ministry, uh, her lawyer actually subpoenaed this interrogation video and we obtained it and uh, it it just was a calamity. Um, so that's how we managed to do subsequent stories with Aiden. Uh, again, as a journalist, source development is really important to me. And as a journalist working in an Indigenous community, uh, those are relationships you have for life. 
right? Yeah, we'll, we'll talk more about those relationships and impacts the, the reporting has on uh, people and communities. Uh, but I, I want to go to Brittany. Uh, uh, Brittany, um, you did a lot of uh, assisting and, and could you just maybe tell us how court reporting assisted in this story? Yeah, so um, my role was primarily as a researcher on the project. Um, and I assisted with obtaining the original court documents that the team needed to uh, proceed with. Um, as Holly said, she came over to my desk and said that this was like a pretty incredible story that was coming out of BC and we needed to get the court documents. So um, in Canada, all the provinces have different rules about what is public and, and what's not. Um, there were numerous filings against the province of British Columbia and the social worker involved. And so I obtained those filings and then summarized them for the investigates team. Now, I gotta ask you, uh, as a young indigenous woman, what was your reaction when you saw that video? Um, for myself, um, yeah, for myself, and I think for many indigenous people, this comes as no surprise and no shock really. Um, she came to report uh, a serious personal injury and was effectively re-victimized in terms of how her interview went. So I was saddened to see how this young Indigenous woman was treated. And uh, you have a background in justice. Can you just explain a little bit how does that inform the journalism that you're doing here at APTM? Yeah, so having studied uh, criminal justice at the University of Winnipeg um, has allowed me to better understand uh, policing, corrections, and the court systems in Canada. Um, it has definitely helped me when reading through court documents. Uh, sometimes the language and terminology is very specific, so it, it helps to have uh, an idea of what they're discussing. Um, especially in terms of the way in which we talk about crime, offenders, and victims, and, um, and how to avoid talking about those things in a way that won't further harm or stigmatize those individuals. Well, good points, and those are always things that we are thinking as, uh, as we do our work as journalists. Uh, Mary, we, we talked a lot uh, about your work in, in this area and, uh, and, and how you uh, started doing some of the work and, and you know, being one of uh, the first of many reporters to start reporting on these issues. Uh, can, can you tell us how you uh, started reporting on these types of issues? Sure. Well, I was asked to be a magazine editor actually from the Matt Rothschild from the Progressive um, back in like 2010. There was a report from Amnesty International that came out called The Maze of Injustice and Sarah Deer, um, who you may have heard of, was super involved in uh, women's uh, issues, Native women's issues here on, on the U.S. side. Uh, she um, helped um, author that report and it was just about the high rates of uh, sexual violence against Native women and you know that of course you know, mainstream America totally overlooks it. And it was the first time that I'd ever really seen too much um, in the mainstream, you know, about this issue. It was like, it suddenly became quote unquote a thing. And uh, uh, so this, Matt, I was just really um, adamant that I should write about it. And I was very reluctant. I said, that's not really my wheelhouse. And I, I didn't, you know, that wasn't something I wanted to write about. But what I ended up doing was writing about my own uh, sexual assaults. And, um, that, you know, sort of segued into a much broader look at, you know, I came to see my, you know, other sisters, uh, Indigenous sisters had similar experiences. I think that at that time, you know, like in 2010, the number was, oh, I think it was like uh, two of three Native women had been sexually assaulted. And we all sort of said we wanted to know who that other woman was who hadn't been assaulted because everybody we knew had been. Um, so I just began kind of pursuing that line of inquiry on a lot of different levels, you know, how sexual violence um, um, does um, permeate Native women's lives and how it's um, um, really ignored, certainly by the mainstream, and that we really don't, uh, we don't report it. It's just sort of like normalized. And so I, I began looking at sex trafficking, um, 
just, uh, you know, and then eventually uh, Michigan murdered Indigenous women as I came, of course, to, you know, be aware of the uh, outstanding work that was being done uh, by Sisters to the North in Canada, uh, the National Inquiry. Of course, myself and some other women down here began to wonder, gosh, I, it certainly must be the same thing down here. We have more Native people here in the States than are in Canada. And, and of course, for us as Indigenous folks, that border is really kind of meaningless. So, of course, I found out, yes, it, it uh, is, you know, an issue here. And um, I began reporting on that. So, um, and I did that, you know, up until really a, a couple of years ago. It actually kind of took a lot out of me emotionally. Um, and I found that I needed to kind of take a break from it. So I still occasionally will do a story about it. Um, but it's very um, uh, emotionally draining to hear uh, a lot of the details of these stories and uh, I find anyway over and over again and I always do feel that when women call me it's primarily women that I really do have to listen to them I, I really do owe them that but it does I find it takes quite a lot out of me and um, on the plus side I think I've done a better job of learning how to take care of myself and to recognize when I'm um, old, maybe overstretched you know um, uh, emotionally yeah, that, that, that's definitely uh, something that we want to be there for each other as journalists and, uh, and when we get together at, at conferences, uh, you know, sh share stories with each other, uh, but also practice uh, self-care as we're doing the job. Um, I want to get back to, uh, you know, something that we talked about and, and, and the communities and, and what impact uh, the reporting and these stories have on communities and people in them. Mary, what was some of the things that you were hearing from people on the ground in the communities when you were doing your stories? Well, a lot, you know, of course, a lot of people don't even talk about it. Um, it was just, no, that doesn't happen. There was a lot of denial um, and, and shame, I think, you know, there's always sort of some um, attitude that somehow we've invited those things to happen mm -hmm. to us. Um, but then as both myself and a lot of other and activists began, you know, it began making it more public and as people began to write about it, I think women, uh, a lot of people were just really grateful that, wow, this is like, there's a space being created so that we can be heard about this. So I just had, oh my gosh, so many people contacting me, you know, sharing similar stories, similar situations. It's like, finally, you know, maybe this, the time has come, things have sort of coalesced in, you know, um, in this country to um, create a space where we might actually be heard. So I think there was a certain relief, really. Now, Holly, I know you have, through uh, your work, heard from many family members, affected family members of uh, missing and murdered. Can you uh, tell us what, what you heard from communities from some of, some of the reporting out of this story? What were people saying when, uh, when we published these? I just wanted to get back to Mary's point as well about, and really like a shout out to her because she was one of the pioneering reporters on this issue. And, you know, uh, I had worked in newsrooms where you would ask to do an MMIWG story and the attitude would be, well, we did one last month, you know, girls go missing all the time. And really the MMIWG uh, problem is where misogyny and racism collide. And uh, really that as somebody who's covered the National Inquiry for APTN, um, you know, I take Mary's point about self-care that uh, you really have to have a robust uh, regimen of self-care in order to absorb that vicarious trauma. Um, so I, I keep a very happy life uh, because I hear so many sad things. Uh, but I could no longer do investigative work that didn't have impact. I didn't want to do stories about uh, used car salesmen. I wanted to do stories like this where there was an immediate and serious condemnation of the officer's behavior uh, against this young woman. Uh, so what happened right in the, of course we got thousands of retweets, uh, the story blazed around the world. Uh, we had the exclusive, um, but we did share tape with other news outlets because our reach is only so wide um, and far. So I felt like it, once we had that tape, 
uh, we could really see for the first time this intersection of misogyny and sexism and, and racism all in one moment. And so what I heard over and over again at the National Inquiry is we did go to police. They told us she was partying. They said she was a runaway. You know, I did go to police. I reported my sexual assault and they demeaned me. They made me feel awful. And here on video was exactly that experience. So in Canada, we have a parliament and there's an opposition and the government and they're all in one house. It's called like two sides of the house. And both sides got up and universally condemned the behavior of this officer. And it was the first time in my career that, you know, you didn't have the conservatives on one side and the liberals on the other side. You had everybody pissed off. And uh, the justice minister immediately said he was going to look into it. But more importantly, what I found was that I got, um, I did get a call from Marion Buller, who was the head of the National Inquiry, to say, you know, this is what we've been hearing all along. But even more important than that, I got calls from other women and tweets from other women and Facebook messages from other women who said, you know, this is exactly what happened to me. And since the reporting, a number of women have come forward to say, this is exactly what happened to me. Now, do they have video evidence of it? No, um, but, but it was very vindicating for them to see that this young woman could stand up to a system that had not only brutalized her through the child welfare system, she got ripped off uh, by her social worker, she uh, was sexually abused and assaulted, she was left poor and homeless, she was exposed to drugs. Here's this woman with all these like hits against her, standing up in a national media story and saying, hey, that was me and this is wrong. And that to me was, you know, probably one of the highlights of my career, including talking to her mother, who had a whole history of socioeconomic issues that, you know, why she gave her up. She gave her up like many people and indigenous people because she thought she would have a better life within the system. And so talking to her mother was probably even more poignant because she was really proud of her kid. For, for pushing through and, and suing the government and essentially getting a settlement for it. So the, the impact on community was amazing. The political impact was amazing. But even more importantly was the fact that a statistic came out of a, of a reinvestigation of sexual assault cases that showed that this Kelowna detachment had a 40% dismissal rate of sexual assault cases. So we knew from work that other journalists have done, the Globe and Mail, with their Unfounded series, the police do not take these seriously. Well, this Kelowna detachment was even taking it less seriously. And so there were parts of the reporting that were, we didn't report that statistic, that was actually discovered by another news outlet, but, but it prompted interest and it sparked all this great reporting. And I thought, this is what journalism is. This is what investigative journalism is. Yeah, and, and a few uh, folks uh, took pieces and did pieces of reporting as being recognized uh, for the uh, Richard LaCourse Award. Uh, mm -hmm. you, you know, you're named on there, Holly and, and Brittany, uh, executive producer of APTN Investigates, Paul Barnsley, video journalist Colin Crozier, uh, we, we also had some folks in news come in and jump on board and, and file as part of this. Maybe you could explain just a little bit about that and how that uh, extension worked. And so, yeah, because essentially this was, you know, after Cullen had finished, he has to go on to another show right away. And so uh, I'm a producer, but I'm a journalist first. And so I always have like little projects that are bubbling around just in case. Uh, so this was a project that clearly needed some coordination. Um, the young woman at the heart of this wouldn't speak to anybody except for me. And so I did fly to Kelowna and spent three or four days with her, but I needed help. Like I, you, journalism is a team sport. That's what somebody used to always say to me. So I wanted to give people here a piece of it 
you know, so that, because we have all sorts of experience, like many newsrooms, we have people with 30 years experience and people with three years experience. And I really wanted everybody to get a piece of it. So we had Lori Hamlin, we had Kathleen Martins, who's got a veteran journalist, Brittany Hobson did the television reporting. And again, um, getting those indigenous voices on screen is so important to me. I don't need to stand in front of a camera and be like, oh, I found this. I want, I want people like Brittany Hobson, I want Brittany, uh, people like Brittany Guillot to just run with it, you know? This is what we found, just go. This is, this is everyone's. So, so each, people, each person played a role in getting various parts of, of the story out on, on various platforms. As you mentioned, Brittany Hobson, her story would have aired on, uh, on the national news and, uh, and, and we had Kathleen, uh, another one of our reporters who has done uh, many stories uh, on the National Inquiry. And, and if we could just, you know, circle back to that, Holly, because that, um, that was a pretty impactful thing to hear from uh, Marion Buller. Um, and, and, you know, some, some folks may, uh, you know, have looked at the National Inquiry as, as somewhat of a victory that, that we had some recognition here in Canada for, for that issue. Um, as someone who's spoken to, to so many family members, um, you know, maybe you can just talk uh, about what, they're, what they say uh, about that inquiry. So the inquiry was, uh, some people see it as a victory. Um, I see it as a roadmap. I mean, the, the work that still needs to be done is, is just immense, right? Uh, there was a collective um, soul uh, sighing operation in the sense that families finally got to get these things off of their chest. But what's changed? You know, we have an RCMP in this country. We have a commissioner who said, who denied that there was systemic racism. Well, you can't come out of that national inquiry as somebody who sat there day after day and listened to hours of testimony. There's no debate whether there's systemic racism in the justice system against indigenous people. And I would be really interested to hear Mary's take on this from the US because, you know, looking to us as this big national inquiry, what it really did is expose the problems, but not create a whole bunch of solutions. And so my question is for Mary in terms of like, when you were doing all of that reporting, were you hoping that there would be a national inquiry or that the government would somehow take up the call? Yeah, <laughs> and I was, because I was thinking you guys had laid the groundwork for that. Um, yeah, and this issue, you know, we've now had this term systemic racism and I like that term, it's a really helpful term. Um, you know, uh, someone once said to me, you know, it took a long time to build these structures that are of systemic racism and entrenched racism. So it's going to take some time to dismantle them. I mean, they're so deeply embedded, you know, just, uh, for instance, I think always of Duluth, Minnesota, and, you know, that women would, uh, you know, for generations, they would, quote, unquote, work the boats. And, you know, women were often assaulted. Sometimes women disappeared. And it was sort of the, um, you really got the sense that for generations, the, the um, opinion of the, of the police as well, that's just part of the rough and tumble kind of milieu of a, of a port town. It was normalized. And so there was no, there was no place for women to go. What if they did go? If they did go, they were concerned that perhaps the police would find a, a, a charge against them for something else, you know? So, I mean, there was really very, very little um, motivation to, to, to report things. Um, so it's, gonna, it's still going to take a long time, I think, to, to dismantle that. We're just now gaining the language to, uh, to challenge it. And you know, we do find, so we're, we are seeing, I, I'll just say it, I, we're seeing a lot of window dressing, um, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, studies, a lot of people, a lot of studying, you know, of course, uh, Indigenous women as well, how long do you have to study and conversate? You know, we already know this is happening. What we would like is some action. And action, I think, would translate as additional people to work and to whose job it is specifically 
you know, is to try to ferret out um, some of the inequities regarding, you know, policing in, uh, in Indian country. So often we will see uh, if you get down into the weeds of these various committees that are formed, you know, um, congressionally, or it, it, that they often, uh, they just add additional duties, you know, onto the, uh, onto the, uh, the, the police or the legislative people or the, the uh, judiciary people. Um, they'll have to carry a full caseload. And then additionally, they'll, they'll be, oh, well, you, you now you've got to work with tribes as well. So, you know, it, it's, it's very, very slow. I, I'm hoping that, you know, um, we're going to get past this conversating part and we're going to start getting, um, some people really walk in their walk in their talk. I mean, I think it's starting to happen, but it's um, you know, it's easy to say, oh, I, you know, I'm against missing and murdered Indigenous women. Who could be for it, right? I mean, it's like, oh, oh, we're against it, you know. And it's more than painting a handprint on your face, um, although that's certainly nice and it's certainly good to bring awareness, but um, an ac action, um, funding, um, and uh, you know, training. I think those are the kinds of things that we need, and hopefully, yeah. Yes, I mean, you know, it's just something we, you know, as a young woman growing up, I lived with all my life, you know, and have how, you know, you're often, in, and what does one do? You know, you let the anger consume you, um, or perhaps, you know, through perhaps various expressions, addiction, or various kind of quote-unquote maladaptive behaviors, you know, um, or you find a way to channel it in, in a little better way. Um, but one still harbors that terrible, that diminishment, that lifelong dim diminishment, that shame, um, that pain, um, and uh, it, one day, I mean, what could it be within my lifetime that there would be a generation of women, young women who don't have to experience that? Wow, what a, what a, what a dream to have. Hmm. Yeah, like for me, that's, you know, for, um, I know that it's not my lived experience, um, but I do know that for somebody like Brittany who, you know, like, why did you go into justice, Brittany? Um, yeah, I mean, I went into justice, uh, you know, because you see so many injustices in terms of Indigenous populations in Canada. They're vastly overrepresented in the justice system. And so as a young person, I wanted to understand why that was and, and get a better yeah, just get a better understanding of what's going on in the justice system and what's happening in Canada and why are uh, Indigenous people um, encountering these situations. And so, yeah. It, it, and, and it sounds, you know, um, like there, there had to have been some challenges as you were going through uh, the, the gathering of information, as you're going through interviewing people affected um, you know, maybe, maybe Holly, you could just touch on a, a, a couple challenges that you recall as you were building the uh, story mm -hmm. and how you overcame those challenges as a reporter. Sure. So, I mean, the big, uh, the big thing was trusting that we had a story. Um, so one of the biggest challenges was, okay, is this just a news story or is this going to turn into an investigative story? And uh, also getting Aiden to trust me enough that we were able to develop this relationship where she felt comfortable uh, talking to me, number one, talking to Cullen, number two. Uh, and also we had to anonymize her because she had been in the child welfare system and in child welfare in Canada, there's an anonymization. You can't, there's like a $50,000 fine if you break it. Uh, so uh, getting her to the table was number one, the biggest challenge. Uh, number two, the second biggest challenge was getting the RCMP to talk to me. Uh, you know, RCMP have, the commissioner has completely denied interview requests by APTN. Uh, you know, they've done interviews with every single other national and non-national news service. They will not speak to us. Um, you know, there's a feeling that we're too aggressive, that we're too, I don't know the reason why, but, um, but it seems that the RCMP will not talk to APTN. So trying to get some information from the RCMP was almost impossible. Uh, we did eventually name the officer and we debate, debated back and forth doing that. Uh, I wanted to give him the heads up just in case he was operational and this hit while he was out in the field. I didn't want him to be 
in any kind of danger. And we named the woman who, uh, her name is Aiden Withers and she's a mom of one and uh, she just got married to her girlfriend. Uh, you know, um, it, she's like this incredible person. And so making sure that she was okay the whole step of the way, not re-traumatizing her, uh, not taking her down a path that was gonna lead to the, some of those social uh, issues. Like I just, I didn't wanna re-victimize her. And so I tried to give her as big a voice in this as, she, as I could and not tell her story. I let her tell her story. Um, and Cullen did as well. Cullen did an amazing job working with her and making sure that it was her voice coming through. Um, and so that was one of the challenge. The other challenge was legally. So a lot of what had gone on wasn't uh, in the court record, a lot of it. So we had to parse out what was in the court record, what was anecdotal, and because court is privileged and anecdotal is just not. And so there was one moment where Brittany really saved me. I was in the middle of a legal bed and I realized I didn't have one of these filing, fil filings with the lawyer. And he was like, where is it? And I'm like, oh, I don't know. And uh, Brittany's like, it's okay, I got it. I took care of it. So again, journalism is like a team sport. And uh, I was just so happy to see that Aiden's voice was heard and, and it was loud, so. Well, thanks for you know sharing uh, some of those challenges, and 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 I think that they are similar um, from journalist to journalist, and um, and 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 the effects right on on telling those stories. Uh, Mary, when we talked, uh, you know, we, we talked about young journalists uh, entering the business and wanting to get into telling these kinds of stories. Uh, I, I wonder if you could share uh, some some advice with uh, the young journalists out there, uh, how to prepare for and, and what to do when telling these stories. Um, having to take care of is, is super important, um, and you know you know really in, it, pretty seriously you know um, take a look at why you want to do this what is it that you want what do you hope to gain from it personally if you do hope to gain something um, and you know I think more than although the stories the people's stories are really important and it's helpful people need to tell their stories they really do but you need to go take another you always have to be looking at how much farther you can go with this how you know I can take this to a higher level you know how can we look at how can we then you know discuss the the reasons for this and you know the structure of the you know of, uh, of law enforcement and the judiciary I mean you've got to be willing to really then um, uh, take a deep, deep dive into policy um, and to read some very boring reports and to uh, uh, you know be willing to keep notes on that and be able to have that sort of at your fingertips in order to have those discussions um, and realize that often I think at least for me I don't know everybody but you know I found that I would get kind of blindsided by stuff. You know, I would think I'm just fine. I'm this tough old journalist, um, but I would um, um, I would feel bad later. You know, and I'll just share with people. I'm a recovering alcoholic. It's been many years, over 20 years now. But in the past, when I worked at newspapers, I often drank over hearing painful, painful things from people. And I really didn't even identify that's what was going on. I mean, it was only later that I learned that I was, you know, that I was trying to medicate myself. Um, so trying to be, you know, aware of of uh, what's going on with you and that you aren't, as a human, you're not immune from these forces that the other humans are subject to. You know, you're going to have some kind, of, and if you didn't have some kind of reaction, you know, we'd all kind of worry about your, about your mental state. So it's quite normal, I think, to have some kind of reaction. And you, you know, you're gonna have to have a game plan um, and try to recognize in yourself, you know, how is it, how do I translate stress? How do I translate pain? Um, those are the kinds of uh, things I would uh, suggest uh, young women um, investigate before they launch into this. Mary, thank you so much for your advice and, and sharing your story here on our webinar today. Uh, Mary uh, is going to exit early from today's webinar. Uh, she does have a deadline. Uh, national correspondent for Indian Country today. Mary Pember, thank you. Thank you so much. Hi, Mary.
Now, now, Holly, uh, you know, we, we heard some good advice there from Mary. I, I hope that you can uh, add on to that and, and give us some best practices. Sure. So uh, anytime a young reporter comes to me and says, I want to work on MMIWG, my first question, like Mary, is why? Why do you want to do that? Uh, because there is, you have to look at dismantling the whole thing. The individual stories in themselves are heartbreaking, um, you know, and, and really unsurprising to Indigenous people. So if you are going to take it from a point of view that, oh, these poor, you know, oh, these poor people, you know, just forget it. Like, just get out of the way. Um, when I was working in mainstream media, I started to think about how I could dismantle this. And so I worked on a project called Unresolved that was all about families whose loved ones uh, had been declared no foul play or, uh, you know, no criminal intent. They were suicides. They were accidents, declared accidents by police. So we assembled 34 women whose cases fit into this, uh, examined the police file, found that, you know, a number of them had been involved in domestic abuse, a number of them their families believed they knew who did it. Um, some of them were found nude or partially nude. Um, there was just all these like, like glaring red flags in the files. And so that's an example of a story where you're moving the narrative. You're moving the narrative forward. You're saying, are police looking at these in the same, with the same intensity as they would non-Indigenous women? And do they not want to find foul play so that they don't have to investigate them anymore? Um, so if you are gonna be a young reporter working on MMIWG, ask yourself why, and then contribute to the conversation. Don't retell stories, don't re-traumatize families. Be really, really smart about how you're going to contribute. On a personal note, um, I had this experience at the inquiry in Thunder Bay and uh, I was exhausted. I came back, I'd been listening to hours of testimony and uh, I, this is when I was at APTN and I was lying down I woke up and there was a woman crouched at the end of my bed and I just looked at her and she looked at me and she swooped right into my heart, like literally like right into my heart and I woke up screaming and uh, I came to APTN and I, I said, oh, I had this insane experience. And uh, an indigenous journalist friend of mine said, oh, well, did you touch something you weren't supposed to? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, actually I did. I put my foot on the sacred fire and this journalist was like, well, you know, you brought her with her, with you, you should smudge your house and, you know, go see the elder and figure it out. And um, I just thought that the, that, you know, for indigenous reporters that, that um, belief in ceremony and culture, it helped me. It, even though I'm not part of it, it helped me. And so I would make sure that you are sound and strong if you're gonna take on this work and make sure that you are lifting up and, and illuminating voices as opposed to silencing with your own voice. Thank you, Holly. I, I just want to, as, as you both were speaking, um, go back to, uh, to this woman, this Indigenous youth. She, she, she was a kid in the child welfare system who was being ripped off and um, that was by her worker. And as she was in there, uh, in the system, she reported a sexual assault. And that led to the tapes and that led to the investigation. And we often talk about in our newsroom how these things are connected. And uh, I, I just wanted to make sure that I made that connection before, before we wrap up because it, to me it was always important uh, to connect those things. And uh, we do that a lot in our work and, and, and uh, another pillar of the work we do is on child welfare stories. Totally. Yeah, she was victimized twice, right? Three times, yeah. four times. And, you know, she's actually doing really well now. I think that it's really important to, to say that, that she did receive a substantial settlement. I won't disclose how much she got, it's confidential. Um, but, you know, 
uh, it's important also to know that the province has admitted vicarious liability for this social worker. So there are approximately 102 uh, youth who will get up to $25,000 each. And just 17 of those 102 were non-Indigenous. And those people will get a $44,000 settlement on top of the 25,000. So the province has admitted they, you know, this happened, um, but we still don't know how, and we don't know who else knew that this was going on. I mean, uh, Riley Saunders worked there since 1996. So we still don't know how many people knew. Well, thank you for, uh, you know, letting us know how things had gone and, and some of the results. I know uh, I, I recently rewatched uh, Broken Trust and, uh, it, you know, they, they, they wanted their voices to be heard and, and they were heard uh, on EPTN, Investigates. Broken Trust, that uh, exists on YouTube and uh, on aptnnews.ca. Uh, before we uh, start wrapping up, we want to hear from our attendees and uh, and look at some of the questions that uh, um, our audience has here. And uh, we have a question from Angel Ellis. Hello, Angel. Um, she's asking, was there a large divide in reporting angles between uh, different news organizations? Uh, how did the media who were taking their quotes from government officials impact uh, the overall uh, impact of the story? And uh, how was that handled by the folks who were elevating the voices uh, of the abused people? Holly, do you want to take that? Sure, that's a good question. Um, the, you know, one of the unique things about working at AP10 is that we have time. Uh, you know, we have managers who are, do not parachute into a community, go there, play bingo, drink tea, you're there, right? Uh, what I found was other media, once they realized that the video was so powerful, some just took our story. Uh, some attributed it to us, some did not. Uh, but this was a huge scoop for a, a small national broadcaster. Um, one of the things that I thought was interesting was that uh, Aiden's voice wasn't front and center. And so I think I only got two phone calls asking to actually speak to her because I had exclusive access to her. And the rest of the mainstream outlets just kind of took oh, this video, watch it, right? Um, and that, I think it, it didn't impact the story negatively, except that it amplified the story. And so I know that forever, it's gonna be that sex assault video story, like, and not Aiden's story, but part of me didn't care because I felt like it was important enough that we needed to broadcast it as widely as we could. Um, but I can honestly say that there was universal condemnation. So there weren't quotes from the usual you know, jerk politicians saying, well, you know, the RCMP did the best they could do. Everybody was as shocked and stunned and disgusted by this video. So I think that that helped the story um, because it, it was just such a consensus. All right, we do have another question here uh, from uh, Pad Losky, there are a lot of Native men that disappear as well. Um, and and um, are journalists looking into those types of stories? Uh, do you want me to answer that, Francine? Yeah, or yeah. yeah. Let, let, let me hear from you, Holly. I think we've had uh, some of our own journalists looking into those types of stories here. Absolutely. Uh, in fact, one of the stories, the first story that I did for APTN Investigates, um, I included a woman whose son went, uh, had disappeared uh, because the calls for the inquiry to include missing and murdered men were ginormous. The, there was a lot of pressure to include 
missing and murdered men because the socioeconomic factors are the same to some degree. Uh, well, they are the same. The lack of access to justice system is the same, except if you're going to be incarcerated. Um, and so there are journalists definitely looking into missing and murdered men as well. Uh, I myself have been working on a project to uh, really look at, we mostly look at incarceration rates, but uh, sometimes it's a long assembly line into jail. Like, how did you get there, right? And many missing and murdered men on that same journey, uh, you know, end up either in jail or they just got out of jail. There are journalists, we aren't looking at that actively right now uh, for investigates because we have our season set, but it's something that is always in the back of my mind, always. Amazing, uh, guys. I'm looking here at our Q&A tab and it looks like our audience questions are all answered for the time being. Uh, but, but let me go to, to you guys, our, our panel, for some, some last words. Uh, Brittany, before we wrap up, is there anything you'd like to add to the discussion before we go today? Um, I don't think so. What, what do you got working on next? I know you guys have been on the road. I know you're plugging away at research. Um, out of curiosity, uh, for some of those who may be too shy to ask, uh, what, what are you plugging away at for uh, next season? Brittany? Yeah, so we're working on a number of stories. Um, we're, I think, first up on the block is a climate change story. Um, so that's looking at climate change in the north. Um, what else do we got? Um, there's a wrongful conviction story coming out. Um, what else is there? We're working on child child welfare. Um, hydro. Yeah, Ho Holly, what else do we got going on? We're working on a hydro story from northern Manitoba about destruction of habitat due to Manitoba hydro um, development in the north. We have a really exciting um, story it's exclusive to us of a woman who has been imprisoned for 28 years. And uh, we went out to Kiskus First Nation in Saskatchewan and tracked down the person that uh, she had allegedly committed the murder with. And uh, he said, it's all me, I did it. Um, so that's exciting. Uh, we've also uh, got a story about climate change, like we said and also a story out of Northern uh, Ontario, Thunder Bay area that is a collaboration with Kenneth Jackson, who's an okay. APN news reporter. Uh, so it's gonna be Cullen and Kenneth. It's like two powerhouses like, <laughs> going out there um, yeah. and they're shooting right now. So they're out on the road on like a 14 day trip uh, to further Kenneth's work on uh, suicides in care. And so I'm really excited to see what that, what happens with that. Yeah. Lots of collaboration going on and uh, the whole team is a powerhouse. And uh, I'm sure Brittany, you'll, you'll play a big role in, in the research that goes into uh, behind a lot of these and uh, especially uh, something uh, along the lines of justice with uh, wrongful conviction. Um, so I think we, we all look forward to seeing those stories coming up on the next season of APPN Investigate. And I also wanted to say, like, she is too modest. Like, mm -hmm. uh, you know, she wasn't even a journalist when she came here. <laughs> so, so I, you know, and this year she just won an amazing award for her work on Broken Circle. Did you ever think you'd be a journalist, Brittany? No, it never really crossed my mind as something that would happen. Um, I feel like I sort of just fell into it and like loved it. Um, but yeah, I mean, sometimes I like still don't even really consider myself a journalist, but I mean, I am. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I started talking about myself as a journalist until it was like a decade in. And then yeah. I was like, oh, okay, I'm a journalist. Okay. No, but no, the, the broken trust, uh, we're just so grateful 
like to be recognized internationally like our our work is known uh, nationally. We've won an award every single year for the work that we do here. And we are a small, small, but mighty team. I mean, there's nine of us in total. Um, and we put out 26 episodes, half hour episodes a year. Right now we're in an hour long format. So we, we just produce an incredible amount of television on a very shoestring budget and you know, I can honestly say we have seven journalists, indigenous journalists who work with us. Um, and and it's, it's the most exciting investigative work that you can do is working uh, here and with these journalists that we have. So having international recognition for our work has been like, I put on lipstick today. Like it's super <laughs> exciting. So thank you very much to Naja for, for recognizing our work. Thank you guys for your work. Uh, Holly Moore, Brittany Geo, Paul Barnes, the executive producer of APTN Investigates, Colin Crozier, and uh, the APTN National News journalist who contributed, Brittany Hobson, Kathleen Martins, and Lori Hamlin. Kudos for your work and congratulations on being the 2020 recipients of Naja's Richard LaCourse. Uh, investigative journalism award which will be handed out at our virtual conference <laughs> thank you guys so much for doing the panel with us and uh, this uh, th this panel was an honor to an honor for me to moderate and, and to hear from you and to share uh, with everyone who attended uh, but I will hand it over back to Brian to wrap up the nausea webinar thank you all right Thank you, Francine, and thank you again to our panelists. We appreciate their time and generosity and wish them the best as they continue to cover these important stories. I'd like to thank everyone for attending and will encourage you to subscribe to the Naja newsletter, visit naja.com and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube for announcements about future roundtables in this series. This concludes the Naja roundtable. We'll see you next time.